Hey everyone, welcome back to Transform Your Workplace. I'm your host, Brandon Laws, and I'm really excited about today's episode. We've got Chris Deaver on the show, and this conversation is packed with fresh takes on leadership, creativity, and why the future of work is all about co-creation. Chris has done amazing work with big names like Disney, Apple, and Roblox, and he's here to share insights from his new book, Brave Together, Lead by Design, Spark Creativity, and Shape the Future with the Power of Co-Creation. In this episode, we get into some big ideas like the rethinking, that think different mindset that Apple's come up with, the importance of breaking down silos, and how we can truly create a collaborative culture. Before we get into the episode, a quick shout out to our sponsors, NMHR, for supporting the show. And if you find today's episode valuable, make sure to subscribe, leave us a rating and review, or share it with anyone who could get value from this episode and wants to transform their workplace. All right, let's dive into the conversation with Chris Deaver. Hey, Chris, it's a pleasure to have you on Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for coming on the show. Great to be here. Thanks, Brandon. Well, it's not often I get to talk to people like you. You've got an impressive background. You're at Roblox currently as uh, their, I think, chief people officer. Or you're leading HR and, and people. So I, I respect what you're doing. And you worked at Disney, Apple, Dell, and a whole host of other gigs. And you've worked around some of the most creative people. So what we're going to talk about today is really exciting to me because I haven't had a conversation like this in a while. I'm excited about it too. Yeah, and I, I, I can't claim a chief people role for the at Roblox, but I, I'm involved with people, empowering leaders, and you know experiences at yeah all the places you mentioned, Apple, Disney. And I think the themes are you know leadership of the future, and that's really interesting you know for me, and I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, me too. We're going to talk about your book. It's called Brave Together, Lead by Design, Spark Creativity and Shape the Future with the Power of Co-Creation. And you, you in the book, you talk about emphasizing like a shift from this like think different mindset, which I think comes from Apple to working different together. And you said that Apple made that shift as well. Um, and I think a lot of us are probably familiar with that think different mindset. So what, what is that shift? Uh, how is it different? And how do you see like this, if organizations adopt that mentality, evolving with the times of leadership and creativity? Yeah, yeah, I think and the right intent is there. It's like being innovative, right? Expressing your voice. And, you know, Steve, when he said about I mean, we started Apple, that was that was the intention. But when you l really look at the roots of what happened from the beginning to it was co-creative. It was Steve and Steve, right? Steve and Jobs and Waz. And this is how great things happen, right? This is how bands that are timeless, you know, create the music they do, the Beatles, right? You two. And they're always at their best when they're doing it together, right? The Avengers. And uh, that's been true. And that was the experience I had at Apple, and when I was hired, it was like, hey, you know, we have 70% of the people are, have been here five years or less. They're new, right, to the company. And we can't teach them the Apple culture fast enough. And so part of the challenge for me was like, okay, how do you take this company to the next level as far as a culture? But it was already like the most valuable company on earth. So imagine it's like, help us improve. It's like, you guys are already amazing, you know, but the opportunity was that I found, I started getting involved with these product teams. So I supported AirPods, you know, iPhone. MacBook, iPad, all of it. And so these are, you know, teams and big organizations, right? Talking thousands of people, right? Engineers working together. And AirPods was one where there was a lot of friction happening. And what we realized rather quickly was, you know, we're not going to get there by just thinking different, right? If we're doing that in silos, and it's great to have innovation. And these people are going to write white papers, PhD, smart people. They do impossible stuff, right? And AirPods were impossible to begin with. Nobody had ever done this, right? Usually, it was always a wire around it, right? And, you know, so guys who come in are like, or people, men, women, like, you can't do what you're trying to do. It's like, well, you're here. We hired you. And you're going to actually help us do the impossible. So they set out to do it. What we found was there was a lot of friction in teams. And it had to do with the silos and it had to do with like, you know, how meetings typically happen, right? It's like, Hey, well, let's set up a meeting and then we'll talk. And then I'll tell you what, what we're doing. And those teams kind of would clash eventually. 
And what we found was there was a lot of burnout because before launch, it was like six to eight hour daily meetings. And when we unpacked it, we realized there's got to be a better way to do this. And having come from Disney, you know, and seeing when we bought Pixar, when the company acquired Pixar, there was that brain trust. And this is how they do their work. So Ed Catmull that started Pixar with Steve Jobs, they've instituted this brain trust. And it's basically a meeting, a standing meeting where it's like a cross-functional staff, right? People come together from hardware, software, you know, each group, and you build stuff together. And it's egos off the table, building blocks on the table. And it's all about best ideas winning. Uh, and so we instituted this with the AirPods. And what happened was, I'd say overnight, it took some time, but it was a one and a half hour to two hour or three hour weekly commitment where they would say, we're going to show up, we're each going to have our perspectives and we're going to start building you know, this together. And the friction went away, right? You had better collaboration, you had co-creation. And so AirPods Pro, I'm wearing them right now. This is proof, right? They're incredible products and they just keep getting better. And by the way, they stood up a $24 billion business, which is bonkers, right? That's a whole company in and of itself. That's, that's, that's a big company. Yeah, um, just that product line? Yeah. That's incredible. And that's just a part of what oh I do. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the best part is, is like, then you have these teams that are just in love with their work. They're doing the best work of their lives and they love working together. Um, so that, that was a big win all around. That's incredible. In the book, you talk about this concept called the mirror test, which reimagines experiences by focusing on the real versus the ideal. How do we use this principle to break free from status quo that a lot of these organizations are experiencing right now? Yeah, I think, you know, for each of us, that's probably one of the hardest things in our lives is, I mean, it, it sounds easy in, in a sense, but it's really hard. It's like, because we can all look in the mirror, right? Uh, but it's more than that. It's like, the depth, right, of asking ourselves essentially the question of like, what do I need to do differently? And it's a question of humility and the leaders, and we're all leaders, right? When we really think about it, we all have the opportunity to lead and we all are leading. So who are we leading and how are we leading? Whether it's family, friends, you know, team, organization. But the question really is, it goes deep because if we wrestle with it properly, there's this reality we're facing, which is our current existence, right? And there's also this ideal version. And if we go too far over index on either one, it's problematic, right? If we're staying in the real, it's like, well, life could feel pretty brutal, right? Like, like it's just hopeless and it's dystopian and, you know, all those sci-fi nightmares of where it ends, it's like, it all starts to feel like that, you know? And then on the ideal, if we go that extreme, it's like, well, it could be Pollyannish and every, you just start to see everything with like, you know, rosy glasses and it's like, hey, everything's better. And, and they're like, well, maybe it's not. But finding the synthesis is what do I need to do differently to, yes, help create that, you know, but you kind of have to start with the real and kind of feed the ideal to the real and start to build. And it takes action. It takes, you know, steps. And really the first step we outline in the book is leading yourself with a question, but you lead with a question and that, that creates, you know, starts to create wisdom, you know, shared wisdom with others. And that's leadership. You know, leadership is you know, how do you empower people? You know, you just go around, you know, if you go around and just answer questions all the time. It's like, well, that's one way to do it, but people are going to get tired of it. They're not going to like you very much. And they're not going to feel like th that they want to work with. And by the way, they can go to Google and they can go to ChatGPT to get answers now. And in ChatGPT, we're finding, at least on the doctor side, it's actually, you know, people enjoy the experience better because most doctors are, I'm not going to say they're jerks, but they're more robotic than Chat GPT, yeah. right? The, the AI, yeah, you're right. Right, and what, and what does that tell us about managers, right, or the experience they have with that? Probably Chat GPT is going to give them a better coaching experience, but this is opportunistic because for those of us, for those of you know anybody listening, it's like, hey, you want to be a leader, or with as an HR professional, you want to coach leaders, like, well, that's an opportunity because we still, I mean, you can you can really amplify your impact by being human, but you know, just just it's the heart to heart stuff, being brave enough to figure out how you can do that together. It makes an impact. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, like how big of a role fear plays into this, like this transformation of, of co-creation. I imagine like ego gets in the way of a lot of people. Actually, I think before you started, we started recording, we were talking about the Mandalorian and how 
think some random YouTube artist, they brought them into the fold in season two for some of the, the crazy technology, the AI that, that they're, they're doing illustrations. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I imagine that team before probably suffered a little bit of like fear of their jobs or wow, we're going to lose our creative collaboration. This new person's coming into the fold. Like maybe just unpack that for me. What kind of fear are we dealing with? Yeah. I mean, look at it. You have one guy on YouTube doing what probably 30 to 40 people are trying to do at the best studio for Star Wars right in the world. But, you know, I think that's an exercise in, in mirror test humility is like, well, hey, let's bring them in, right? Let's partner with them. And they, and they start to co-create. That's the best answer is ride the wave, right, of co-creation. And what it did for them was like they created a much better product, right? And it, and it had to be integrated. It wasn't just like, hey, you have a standalone and, you know, on YouTube and, you know, I'd say anybody could do that. But the guy was a one-man studio, right? But hey, but the new world is, hey, what if we build that together, right? What if you co-create together? I mean, if you look at some of the things that Disney has done well, I mean, they're getting a lot of flack on some things. But one thing you, you can't fault them for is, you know, Bob Iger was involved in this, Steve Jobs was involved in this, and certainly Ed Catmull that started Pixar was, they brought in some great brands together and they create an ecosystem, Right. And they basically own our childhood now. Right. You got like, you knocked out like <laughs> Star Wars, Marvel. It's like, you got it all, you know? And now they're like recreating all these old animated movies that I watched as a kid. And, and it's like, nah, I just saw the trailer for Snow White and you're like, what is happening? Yeah. Here? Now with, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. So uh, let's hope. Don't ruin it. Yeah. Yeah. So no pressure, right. For them. But uh, I can't, you know, vouch for all of their, the productions. But what I will say is like, yeah, I mean, by and large, when you look at the best work, it's always been co-creative. Uh, there's a story in our book we include, it's chapter 16, about the inception of Iron Man and how that started. And Favreau, John Favreau, who directed Mandalorian with his gallery team of directors, which, by the way, Ed Catmull, who started Pixar, we had a hunch about this. We're like, we think he needs connected to John Favreau. We didn't know. But Ed's an, an advisor, a friend of ours for Brave Corps. And so we met with him. We're like, hey, we think you got something to do with you know John Favreau. And he goes... He starts smiling like like a kid in the candy store. He goes, yeah. He said, you know, a lot of Disney directors have reached out to me for advice. You know, Ed was president of Disney Animation too, right, along with Pixar once they got acquired. But he said, um, you know, the one director that has ever come to Pixar and sat in the brain trust meetings and immersed themselves in that, John Favreau. And it shows, right? He reinvents the Star Wars universe with Mandalorian, which, you know, after – I'm not going to go there, but well, you know, seven through nine were controversial to say the least, right? Let's say. And Mandalorian was like anybody on any extreme, like basically it was, it was well received, right? And there's a reason he created a brain trust, right? This gallery of directors that partnered together. And the shorthand is Iron Man, they did the same thing. Him and by the way, he fought to get Robert Downey Jr. there. Downey Jr. was in a, he was in a down part of his career. The suits at Marvel didn't want to hire him. And Five wrote, John really fought for that. And then Jeff Bridges was involved. And as they're doing this filming, Jeff said on, on this podcast, he's like, they didn't really have a script. Like he showed up in the trailer and, th and this is like, he's a veteran actor, right? Jeff Bridges is classic. And, but he goes, I was scared. <laughs> Talk about fear, right? It's like he's like, I like having a script, right? And so, but he shows up and he goes, Favreau and Downey Jr. They're like riffing, and he's like, Well, what we, what do you think character would say now? Oh, well, I'll just try that, right? And they're improving, and the suits, like, I don't know if it's Kevin Feige or who, but they're sitting in the trailer, like, Oh, that character wouldn't say that. And Favreau's like, I don't care. That's how we're gonna do it. Like, let's just keep going. And they rode this wave, and Jeff Bridges said, This is like a multi, like two hundred million dollar, whatever it costs, right, to make this. And by the way. The whole Marvel universe is hanging on this. If it's successful, yeah, they don't know that at the time. It transformed it completely. Yeah, so he rides the wave, and guess what? It turns out to be, you know, what it did. Blockbuster sets the tone for the whole, you know, Marvel universe and and beyond. So, I, I think things like that. And we may ask ourselves, like, what does that have to do with other business or workplace? You know, we're not a creative team. We're not in that creative world. Well, the same principles apply, right? Like, why are meetings sometimes so frustrating or boring, right, and disengaging? Well, somebody has an agenda, and they're pushing through, and they have answers, and that does not engage us, right, especially Gen Y and Z. You know, uh, I mean, everybody else, too, but we don't always admit it, right, the other generation. But now it's everybody. It's like, hey, meetings suck. Let's get real. But what if we reimagine meetings as a different experience that's co-creative? And how hard is that? Well, it's as simple as just start with leading with questions. What if we plant a question a week in advance? 
let people just marinate on that. Yeah. You know? Some of the younger generation people I work with, they, they appreciate the questions in advance. Uh, some of them are not outspoken. They might be more reserved and just need time to think. And that maybe that's just how they operate. And I think as we have a lot of different working styles now, like what four generations in the workplace right now, we do need to like try to find ways to have all of them feel included and collaborate better. And, and we might have to flex a little bit more than we ever have. Yeah, it's it's a huge opportunity. I mean, I think these things are are, are big opportunities. That yeah, reimagine meetings, reimagine some of these things that we if we don't like it. It's like well, maybe we, you know it can be better, and leaders yeah. can be better. What are some other ways that, like, if you think of, you've worked with some really creative people and teams, other businesses and leaders that you've talked to, and if you could just like observe how they are leading and structuring some of the things inside their businesses, how are they maybe stifling the creativity that they could otherwise unlock? Yeah, that's a good question. I think most leaders, as a starting point, they, they may not be thinking about creativity, right? Now we talk about innovation and most most companies know the value of innovation or unlocking that in the market. But I think what we don't always talk about is what you just asked, which is the input leads to the output. So the question of like having a lens to see creativity as important, like first, right? Because like most of what business has become is it's an exercise in in metrics, right? You know, performance, results, and it's what it feels like oftentimes. But it's not to say that the but the best companies the best cultures, the best brands, the ones we admire, you know, they're, they're actually kind of deeply in, you know, building things together. They're builders. They see themselves as builders. And so if a leader starts with like, Hey, my team, my people, they're not your people anyways, but they're not employees and you're not, you know, the boss. What if you're a co-creator? What if they're your co-creators? Right. And then if you set that tone with them and then, and then how do you treat the conversation? Well, that's different than just, I'm going to see what I can squeeze out of them. Or, well, what if the, you know, the potential energy that's turning kinetic is like, what if it's only 10% we're getting out of them, right? We talk about the brain's potential for what it can do. Well, if that's true about people in your team, and if it is 10%, let's say, that whole 90% that's untapped, right? What if you can unlock that with, you know, in very simple ways? And there are practical ways. We talked about leading with question. That's one. But, you know, understanding people on a deeper level. And this isn't hard, right? It's just like, what if you approach things more like you approach your friends, right? Or people that you know, and just have a conversation. You don't have to be so informal about it, but, you know, just being real people and, and leading with your heart. People appreciate that, you know? You shared how we're in this like new wave of the contextual age and how we shifted from the information age over to this new contextual age. What are some of those key differences between those two waves? Yeah, I think, you know, the first being efficiency, very focused on work harder, right? It's industrial age. It's it's very manual, right? It's our hands. You know, the next information age, work smarter. Yeah. You know, it's about information, right? It's exchange. It's like, hey, knowledge is power, right? But is knowledge power anymore? In a world of Google, in a world of Chat GPT, right? Where you can access it at your fingertips. It's been fully democratized, right? And we're talking global, right? Generally speaking. And so I don't think we even live in those worlds anymore. People may believe we do. But the truth is, is this big wave of the future that's already hitting is co-creation and the value of that and the impact of that. We're seeing brands start to partner you know, together. We're seeing people working in teams differently or as, as more collective. And this is what people want, right? And what that does is it creates a massive amount of not just value, but possibilities, right? In infinite combinations, right, of what you can produce uh, for product services, and experiences, right? And then, and then, okay, well, I mean, like we were talking earlier about the, the school bus thing, you know, advisor, he's working with, you know, his team and their startup, they decide to reinvent the business of school buses. And you think, gosh, that sounds so horribly boring, <laughs> Not <sexy>. right? <laughs> yeah. Like who, and that's the point. It's like, who's ever looking at, but there are so many things like this, where like people are not looking at, they've never looked at for decades, right? Always been the same but they're doing EVs. They're a nice kind of luxurious ride or great, a better experience, which is not hard, right? It's a low bar, yeah. but it's a, it's a better experience for kids. And it's gone gangbusters. It's a unicorn company. And you know, I think there's things like that that could surprise us about what is possible in business in particular in our lives, right? Like 
you know, co-creative conversations can happen in a marriage. They can happen with your kids. You know, that's powerful. In the book, there's a triangle that had at the base employees. The other uh, point was entrepreneurship and then co-creation at the top. And you're arguing that co-creation is like that, where you want to be. What are some of the key differences between how entrepreneurs behave, employees behave, and that co-creator, which we're arguing that we, we need to be there because that's where, where we unlock the, the creativity and innovation? Yeah, I can share these, uh, I, you know, and those listening, some of the extreme version, right, which makes, it's kind of funny, right, like that we've seen in the past, at least. Now, there's, this may be shifting a little bit, but, you know, the entrepreneur is like the extreme is the guy who's live streaming on LinkedIn, bragging about his Lambos that are like, you know, behind him and the mansion that's there, that's probably green screened and the Lambos are borrowed, right? Oh, totally. <laughs> And he's like chucking the money out. It's all about freedom, right? And you're like, well, freedom sounds pretty good like that, right? Like, you know, it's raining money. But the reality is probably far different. It's anybody that talks to an entrepreneur who's been through a startup, it's a version of hell. It's really hard, right? So there's a messy middle that continues. And even if it goes big, there's a lot of tough valleys, right? That's not a realistic view. And the argument that happens in those extremes is, okay, you have an entrepreneurial mindset, which says, hey, it's freedom, it's autonomy. And, and that's true. That, that is true. There's more autonomy in that sense of like, hey, I, I can control my schedule. You know, I, I don't have to listen to a boss or whatever. And then the employee will say, well, I get a steady paycheck. I get uh, more security. And that's true as well, right? And are either points of view wrong? Well, no, they're actually kind of both right. And is it possible, uh, we talk about there's the dialectic or Hegel's dialectic is like, you have a thesis, you have an antithesis, and then you find the synthesis, right? The thesis is employees. The antithesis is entrepreneurs. The synthesis is co-creator. And the co-creator can exist in either world, hmm. you know, or both. So someone can be an employee and be entrepreneuring. They could be building something within a company. I've seen this happen. I've been part of these billion dollar solutions that happen inside of a company. You know, or they could be an entrepreneur and start that, or they could do both in today's world. And there's 60 to 70% of people are freelancing or have a, a side startup that they're building, right? As they're doing their work, you know, day job. And I'd say that's new, but that's, that's the future, right? In a sense too, because it is the future. people want to express. We have our creative propensity. You're doing it right now. I, I'd do it as well. And I think it is the thing it is the future. We want to build and create, no doubt. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. You wrote about turning pain into power and we're going to experience challenges and adversity, but how do we learn from those to come out better for it and maybe unlock some sort of creativity and innovation as a result of going through that pain? Yeah, I can share my experience with that. I, I share a bit of it in the book. Um, a deeper dive is I, I went through, it was just a shock to my system and you know, personal experience, uh, divorce, and there were some other things that happened financially and just autobiographically, this is my, that was a moment for me where I, I realized it was a valley. It was so deep that I hadn't experienced before. I think a lot of us, you know, post COVID or, or during COVID experienced either a version of death of a loved one, some kind of sickness, a financial burden that's either happened or has continued to weigh on us. We've all had things happen. And I think the current future may feel more dystopian, right? And for me, it was a moment where I thought, wow, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Like, this is so brutal. And what I found was, you know, they've done longitudinal studies, Harvard has over the course of 80 years, and asked this question of like, what is happiness, right? Happiness is relationships, full stop. And relationships, I'd say, are what got me out of that. And that continues to be true. Now, it could start with the relationship with yourself, with a higher power, if you believe in one, the people you love, all of these things combine into the force to power you forward. And that's what happened for me. And the pain that I experienced, it felt so deep. You know, I realized that, well, the valley, when it's inverted, it turns into a mountain. And that's absolutely true in our lives. And it continues to be true. You know, there, and we, we have different mountains to climb, different valleys that hit at different times. But I, I think a lot about, you know, there's a moment in uh, Days of Future Past, the X-Men movie, where Dr. X is facing the dystopian future. Everything's falling apart, right? It's all imploding. And here he is, right? Of course, John Luke, or no, you know, I'm talking about the actor. He's playing and he's experiencing this, but it's like he has every reason to have zero hope. It's over, right? It's the end. Uh, it's end game for them. But he goes back in time and has a conversation with his younger self. 
And his younger self, Dr. X, you know, Charles, is in shambles. He's got addictions. He's a mess. He's in the deep valley of his own personal life. But the world's pretty good. He's just, his experience is bad, right? But he thinks the world's ending himself. It's the opposite. But so the moment happens where the future Dr. X says to him, to his younger self, we need you to hope again, right? And, and I think that's the message we each, our future self is, is offering to us right now, you know, is to hope again. That's fuel for the future. And if we can do that in circumstances that are messy, you know, I've realized life itself can be a, just one big messy middle because there's going to be a trial and a challenge right around the corner. You know, I don't know. The common saying is like, no pain, no gain. I'm like, I, I got a lot. Of, I got enough pain. I have to go looking for pain all the time. You know, it's great in the weight room, but even there, you're like, you have to be smart about it, right? Like you don't want to break stuff, you know, overdo it. But the point is, is like, we have enough pain that it's just turning this into power, turning it into power. A thought's coming to mind too, like uh, when it comes to like working in teams or, you know, building the next gen AirPods or whatever, and you're working with a team, is it, does it help to think with the end in mind? Like, here's what we're visualizing that we're wanting to create. Right now we're stuck and it's messy, but to think like that's where we're going and our future is going to look bright. Is it helpful for teams to to start to visualize that? Oh, for sure. I mean, especially when you're dealing... As uh, Scott Belsky, he's a chief product officer at Adobe. We had I had a conversation with him about this, we, especially when you're at the edge of reason, right? We have moments in our lives that can feel like that. But I think especially when you're trying to do something that feels impossible, staying focused on the North Star, right? And in this case with AirPods, it was, why are we doing this? It's we want to make the best product for people, right? And what that does is that transcends any of this other stuff, right? If personally I'm saying, Hey, let's say the battery team. Hey, we want to build the best battery. And, and they start having an argument with the design team. They say, hey, well, you can't really fit that battery. It's too big. And, you know, and the engineers are like, well, you need to get these chips in there. You know, everybody wants to, and they want to be known for this. It's like, hey, but if, if it's about your thing, and by the way, for each of those pieces that goes into this little, you know, product, there's thousands of white papers that went into that, right? There's thousands of people, right, that are just working on that one little piece and, but if they want it to be about them, you're not going to get that movie that's going to blow people's minds and that's going to, you know, be deeply seated and anchored in their soul that they carry with them. And like a movie where the credits roll and you're like, there's thousands of people that were involved. Well, that's how the best things happen. And if people are okay with, you know, well, but guess what? Then they can be so proud of the product that emerges because then, you know, those teams are like, hey, it's it's the whole thing. It's the thing. It's itself, right? It. And the hero, by the way, is the customer. The hero is the people. We're giving them something in their story that's giving, you know, powering their journey. It's not about, you know, the engineer, this person's self-promoting. And that's a different mindset. I think that is also something that in business can really help power teams and, and the future of workplace. Because like, you know, a leader may come in and say, they might say it this way, but they're essentially trying to be the hero, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I spend a lot of time, I'm, I uh, lead marketing for my organization, and I adopted this uh, building a story brand mindset with Donald Miller's the author of that. And I think he points to Pixar and how a, a really good story is structured. And it's like, you got the villain, you got the hero, you got the guide. And too often in our businesses and our teams, we're trying to be the hero when it's actually the the product or the service that we're trying to develop is actually the the heroes, the customer, the person using that product. We're just the guide. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's true, you know, with, with leaders too, as they think about their teams, it's like, so it carries through, right? So it's mm -hmm. like hero being the product. Well, then the hero of that to help build that is the team Yeah. that, and then for the team to happen. Okay. Then at that point, maybe say, Hey, I can be the leader hero, but I'm going to make the hero sacrifice. Yes. And the hero sacrifice is to let go of ego. Right. That's, that's hard, but it makes all the difference. Yeah, totally. You have a chapter called shatter the shark tank and you're pretty critical of the shark tank and just that whole competitive business environment. Why are you critical of that? And, you know, how do we get organizations to transition into one that maybe prioritizes empathy and connection and shared purpose, the things that we're talking about today, which will help us innovate and be creative. Yeah. I love that we're going there. I haven't, I don't think I've gone there on a podcast recently. So, okay. So first of all, I'm a closet fan of shark tank. Oh, totally. You know, Cause it's fun. It's really entertaining it looks cutthroat though <laughs> yeah and, and I, I mean years ago what 10 15 years it was always like and still it's still true you have to respect and love the fact that it's like entrepreneurialism at its at, i'd say it's best 
these people are creating things that are making a difference in the world. But the challenge there is like this, you know, kind of exec boardroom, uh, sitting in the high chair, you know, squeezing people for all their worth, all their equity, you know, okay. It may not be that brutal. I think the tables are starting to turn now on it because you see people show up more where they're like, they're like, give me 500K for 5%, you know, 1%. And then they're, they, <laughs> they've shifted now. Yeah. I think they're onto it. But for so long, it has been this, we're going to squeeze you. And then the behaviors, the sharky behaviors are, you know, it's, it's about ego, right? It's about like, you know, what's in it for them? Very transactional, all about money, right? And these aren't motivators, and they're not sustainable motivators, right? The things that, you know, guys like Steve Jobs, what did they talk about? Changing people's lives, changing the world, right? And in those meetings, behind closed doors even, in those companies, they talk about it that way. It's like, well, we want to reach people's hearts. We want their hearts to sing with our products, you know, and our services and whatever those are, right, for anybody. And this could be, you know, whatever the product or service is, people want that in their lives, and then if you build a culture that's centered around that approach, that makes all the difference. So well said. Well, we're getting to the point where I need to wrap up, but uh, I want to end with this because it's so fresh on my mind. I saw a clip of Eric Schmidt, ex-CEO uh, of Google, yesterday talking about, we need to have people in person to be more creative. And it was met with a lot of backlash because I think there's a lot of organizations that our employees really want to work hybrid or remote. But how do we uh, maybe respond to what you think about that? I'm curious what your take is on that. I'm sure you saw it. And then two, I don't think the remote or hybrid thing is going away at all. Um, in fact, I think we can get really creative people if we can have talent across the world working with us and in our teams. How do we unlock creativity in those environments? So that's, that's part two to the question. Yeah, I love that question. I mean, I think the short answer is, okay, the world's changed and we all know this and it's not going back to what it was. And that's good, right? And yet... I think in the collective sense of building and being builders, we have to ask ourselves, like, how does this happen? How do we do this, right? And given the context, and I would say this can probably happen in many different ways. And, you know, we're far more connected than we used to be, right? Like, I don't know, back in the 80s and 90s, we'd say, or 2000s even, you know, it's going to be amazing. We had like that video thing to be able to talk on video and, and then it showed up and like nobody used it, Right. Like there I was at Apple and like we had FaceTime, we do meet conference meeting calls on audio. And I'm like, we invented FaceTime, like what the heck? But we have those tools, but you know, post COVID, everybody's on Zoom, right? And you know, or Google or whatever the platform. And I think this is a good thing. I believe too that the hybrid future isn't going away and hybrid in many senses of the word, right? And you could look at the co-creator thing as hybrid and how do we build together? I mean, there is a, something to be said about that human connection, that personal connection. 100%. I'm never discounting that. You know? And so if that's like, hey, you're having lunch with somebody or however you show up, wherever that context that is. But so much can be done, you know, in so many different ways. And building is happening, you know. I think it's – this is the funny thing about this. I think so many um, leaders who like to be known for their opinions are so eager to opine on this because they want to take a position – Right. Yeah. And it's not a simple, I think my position. Yeah. Yeah. My position is that, right. I think the, the position that of the future is it's not that simple. Right. And what it is though, is I will like what we have experienced is we brought our work home with us. Right. And during COVID that was extreme version of that. And my daughter who was like on, I mean, it was essentially her work. She was in kindergarten, but she's doing online school. She would go 30 minutes into it. And like, she's like, I'm done. Close the toilet and run off. I like faith. <laughs> yeah, I'm like you can't do that. You got to be on for six hours. I'm thinking, like, who the heck at five years old is going to sit there nope. for six hours? Not a chance. Horrible. Like this nightmare fuel, right? But I think for all of us, what we did experience in that sense was, you know, with work, we brought it home. But that's a shift, right? Where it used to be, and that concept of like exact presence, right? How do you show up? You're like, well, I want people to show up in an organic way to be themselves, right? And that's what's happening now. I think the, and the companies that lean into that future are going to win. And I like the idea of a hybrid approach. I think, you know, there's ways that remote can happen to work. And it's definitely not the old world of like, hey, the draconian, it's our way or the highway at all times. And everybody's in, I mean, I look at my, I, I did the five days a week road warrior. I mean, the time alone of like how much that 
carves out from your time with your family and all the stuff. Yeah. And, and, and especially when you have high traffic zones. So I'm grateful that like it's shifted. And I think that, you know, and, and companies that need to find a balance that I think they're finding it. I think the ones that are saying, Hey, maybe it's a couple of days in the office, you know, or mm-hmm. three days, even, I mean, even three days, it's like, you still have, you know, the bookends and that's actually like kind of a four day time frame set out outside of it. That's pretty good. You know? So I, I think they're finding the balance and I, yeah, but this, that was the funny thing about, and I don't know Eric personally, but it was a funny comment because it's like, Oh, that would just solve for the whole thing. And you're like, yeah, right. Like, yeah, I'm sure that would, you know, I think actually if you tried to run the company with that attitude, it would work for like a day, just like, just yeah, like that comment yeah. worked for a day. And then I think he apologized officially today. I think you know? did too. I think because like, even in the context of our discussion, I think like he probably wanted to make a stance or maybe he was the, the question he was asked was like pointed in, in that direction. He felt like he had to make a call one way or another, but I think like it's more about how we're leading and it probably leads to this co-creation stuff that we're talking about. It's like the leaders need to create an environment that we're able to co-create. And that's really where we need to spend our energy is how do we teach our leaders and managers and our, and our people to work together better? It's not about remote or hybrid or in-person work environments. It's about how are we interacting with each other and getting the best ideas out on the table? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think that's a good example too of a you know, shift, right? And there's, there's a shift for all of us to make. And, you know, Steve Jobs made a shift from kind of, we call it in the book, the rough Steve to change Steve. And I think if there are those things that aren't going to serve the future, hey, just make the changes, the shift. Yeah. Chris, I love this discussion. It was, it's one of my favorite that I've had recently. So I, I really appreciate it. Your book is called Brave Together, Lead by Design, Spark Creativity, and shape the future with the power of co-creation. There's so much in this book we didn't even touch on. So make sure if you're listening, go get this book. It's fantastic. Chris, what do you want to leave people with from a a parting thought or uh, point people to resources that you have out there? Thank you so much, Brandon. Yeah, it's I've really enjoyed the conversation as well. And you can find us at bravecore.co. You know, there's an audio book, you know, the physical copy, there's a video book available on lit video books. And we love to connect too. So I'm on LinkedIn. I think the main, the point I too, I'd love to stay, you know, stick and to share with people is, you know, the future is, it's not really as much about being self-made as it is about, it's a shared future. And the shared future is not just about being brave or braving it alone. It's about being brave together. Thanks for coming on, Chris. Appreciate you. Thanks, Brandon. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in for today's episode of Transform Your Workplace. The content on this show is strictly for general information and educational purposes only so that you can go transform your workplace in a positive way. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on the show are the guest's own and don't represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of either Zenium HR, the sponsor of the show, or me, the host, Brandon Laws. Additionally, Zenium HR or myself, Brandon Laws, doesn't endorse any guest, their business, or any organization they represent, so discretion is advised. We encourage you to work with a trusted advisor to find a custom approach that fits your organization's needs. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode.